Some numbers can be written as the product of two others, but some can't. Numbers of the first type we call composite, while numbers of the second we call prime. The riddle we'll begin to tackle today is, how can we tell which is which? Or, to riff on Shakespeare for a moment, prime or not prime? That is the question. Sometimes it's easy to tell. For example, if the number ends in 2, 4, 6, or 8, then we know that our number can be written as a product with 2. Similarly, if the first digit of our number is a 0 or a 5, we know we can write it as a product with 5. There's also a neat trick to tell if a number is divisible by 3. Just add up the digits, and if the result is divisible by 3, then our original number is also divisible by 3. Of course, if you can remember your multiplication table, you can probably recognize most composite numbers less than 100. But how do we go about tackling this problem in a more systematic way? And how do we make it work with numbers larger than 100? Much, much larger than 100. Good morning, Internet. I am Matt Buyak, and in this video, we'll begin our ascent of a mathematical mountain of sorts, trying to understand how we can determine when a very large number is prime. My plan is to do a series of six videos, each corresponding to one of the locations on our map. I expect that, as with climbing an actual mountain, standing at the bottom, looking upward toward the summit, the path that lies ahead might be quite intimidating. But rest assured, we're going to start with the basics and take it one step at a time, and before you know it, we'll be standing on the summit. But before we get into the technical details, I want to give a bit of motivation for why this question is worth studying in the first place. One of the criticisms often made of topics in pure mathematics, such as number theory, is that while they can be quite beautiful, they have little relevance in the real world. And though I'm perfectly content to appreciate the beauty in such math for its own sake, I think it's worth noting that this is one of the most important subjects, once considered to be purely aesthetic, that was suddenly found to have tremendous practical importance. And that's because it will finally let us finish our solution to problem number 60 from the Project Euler Problem Archive. I'm kidding, of course. It will let us do that. But the real reason why this topic is important is that the problem of finding large primes is at the heart of many of the most important cryptographic systems in modern computer security. Many of the features of the internet that we take for granted, for example, buying stuff on Amazon, paying bills online, communicating securely with friends and family, perhaps even working remotely over a VPN, all depend on the kind of cryptography made possible by large prime numbers and other similar topics in number theory. But enough about practical importance, let's nerd out. Now, before we get started on our problem proper, we should probably define exactly what we mean by a prime number. I know starting with definitions is something of an academic cliche, but Bear with me, because there's actually some interesting history here. There's a multitude of definitions that have been used to describe the prime numbers over the years, but not all of them agree. In fact, of the definitions suggested here, only one matches the modern convention. Fortunately, if we exclude the definitions that are just wrong, the rest essentially all agree for every integer greater than 2. So, in order to clarify our definition, we really just have to answer the question of primality for those smaller integers. The modern definition considers 2 to be prime and 1 to be neither prime nor composite. But some mathematicians of the past considered both 2 and 1 to be prime, while others considered neither to be prime. Probably the most uh, interesting example of this in my opinion, can be seen in a letter sent by the mathematician Christian Goldbach in the year 1742, in which he discusses what would eventually become known as the Goldbach conjecture, which is still one of the most famous unsolved problems in mathematics to this day. In the letter, we see Goldbach writing the numbers 4, 5, and 6 as sums of progressively smaller prime numbers, ending with 1 because Goldbach considered to uh, 1 to be the smallest prime number. 
What makes this letter even more noteworthy is its recipient, none other than Leonard Euler himself, the namesake of the previously mentioned Project Euler.net, and arguably the greatest mathematician of the 18th century. Now, perhaps the reason why Goldbach's convention of considering one to be prime was eventually abandoned is that if we did consider one to be prime, many of the most important theorems involving primes would no longer be true. For example, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which states that natural numbers can be factored into primes and can be done so uniquely. On the other hand, there are many theorems which only hold for odd primes, so perhaps there's an argument to be made uh, that two shouldn't be counted as prime. In any case, at least for now, it's still considered to be part of the club. So now that we have a clear definition and a bit of historical context, let's look at some simple examples. Is 57 prime? Nope, three times 19 is 57, so 57 is not prime. But whether you had to think about that for a moment or uh, knew it immediately, once you're given either three or 19 as a divisor, it's trivial to verify. What about 97? Well, the answer is yes, but how do we prove it? There's an asymmetry to the problem that we're trying to solve. Showing that a number is composite amounts to finding just a single factor pair. But proving a number is prime means proving that no such pair exists. And in general, proving that something doesn't exist is a very difficult thing to do. The most obvious approach is just to try each divisor up to the number in question and see if it works. This is called trial division and is the first of three algorithms that we'll consider in this series. It isn't particularly efficient in its most basic form, but it gets the job done. Now let's see what the code might look like for this approach. Don't worry if you're not a programmer or aren't familiar with C++. My hope is that you'll be able to understand this section even without reading the code. Also, my expectation is that only this video and the last video in the series will actually involve any programming. And so if number theory is more your style, don't worry, there's plenty of that coming up. <clears throat> in any case, to explain this code in plain English, it takes a given integer, n, and checks does 2 divide n, does 3 divide n, does 4 divide n, does 5 divide n, and so on. And if it finds a divisor of n, it reports that n is not prime. But if it tries every possible divisor and uh, none of them divide n, then it reports that n is prime. As I said a moment ago, this isn't the most efficient way of tackling the problem. I expect even those of you who aren't software engineers or computer scientists could probably suggest some improvements. For example, you might observe that divisors come in pairs, and we actually need to only search for one member of each pair. Consider the number 216, which has seven factor pairs. If we design our search to consider the smaller divisor from each pair, we would want to be sure to search for 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, and 12. While we could safely pass on 18, 24, 27, 36, 54, 72, and 108. Going back to our code for a moment, your intuition might be that we should just search up to n divided by 2, since the smaller divisor from each pair should be less than that. And that's not wrong, but we can do better. We can actually prove that the upper bound for the smaller divisor should be the square root of n rather than n divided by 2. And that's because if both elements of a factor pair were greater than the square root of n, then their product would have to be greater than n itself. But that's a contradiction because we know that their product must be precisely equal to n. Now, if you're interested in the details of that proof or you didn't quite follow what I just said, you might want to pause the video and consider this slide more carefully. Adding this new upper bound to our code might look something like this. Though taking the square root is an expensive operation, so depending on your hardware and the exact value of n that you're testing, it might actually be faster to do something like this. That is, rather than comparing each divisor against the square root of n, we're comparing n against the square of each divisor. 
And that's because taking the product of two numbers is typically much faster than taking the square root of a number. Just to emphasize what a difference this makes, this is our proof of the primality of 97 updated with our new optimization. Notice how much shorter the list of candidates is. But even with this shorter list, you might notice some redundancy. For example, once we see that 3 doesn't divide 97, we know that any multiple of 3 also doesn't divide 97. So 6 and 9 are out. Similarly, once we check that 2 doesn't divide 97, we know that no other even number can divide 97 either. So 4 and 8 are out. In fact, we only have to consider prime numbers as divisors because any composite number will necessarily have some smaller divisor that we've already considered. Keeping this in mind, we can update our code like this. Now on each iteration of the loop, we calculate the ith prime and use that as our divisor. So now let's consider how our optimizations perform with a number of significant size. In order to determine whether 999,999,937 is prime, we would need to check 999,999,936 divisors with the original algorithm, 31,622 divisors less than the square root, but just 3,401 prime divisors less than the square root. Obviously, this is a huge improvement, but aren't we skipping over something important? In the code I showed a moment ago, I made use of a function called get prime. Now, at best, you might accuse me of skipping over some potentially important implementation details, but at worst, it looks like we might be headed for some kind of infinite regrets. That is, if our implementation of get prime itself requires some kind of primality testing, aren't we just going in circles? Well, fortunately, there's a separate algorithm for generating primes called the sieve of Eratosthenes. So we can use that algorithm to generate primes and then use those primes to speed up our primality testing. But if we have an algorithm for generating primes, why do we need a separate algorithm for doing primality testing? Can't we just use the sieve of Eratosthenes for both? Well, the sieve is great for generating primes up to 1 million and still does pretty well up to 10 million, but after that, it really starts to struggle. Fortunately, we don't need to generate primes up to the number in question. We only need to generate primes up to the square root of the number in question. So if we can quickly generate primes up to 1 million, we should be able to do reasonably efficient primality testing up to 1 trillion. So that's it, right? 1 trillion should be plenty big enough, right? I guess I can just cancel the other five videos I had planned for this series. Or maybe not. The performance of our algorithm still isn't great. Doing 3,400 divisions to determine that 999999937 is prime is fine if that's the only number we're testing. But if we're testing thousands or millions of numbers to see if they are prime, trial division just isn't going to be fast enough. Also, just to put things in perspective, we can store any number less than 1 trillion in just 40 bits, while the National Institute of Standards and Technology recommends that RSA encryption keys be at least 2,048 bits in length. So while trial division certainly wins awards for its simplicity, if we want to be able to test seriously large primes, we're going to have to learn some more sophisticated methods. And that means learning a little bit of number theory. In particular, in the next video, we'll take a look at modular arithmetic and Fermat's little theorem. I do hope you'll join me. This isn't the most efficient way of solving the problem. I, no, 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 no. Let's try that again.